Well, very good. Well, welcome everyone. We have a small but mighty group with us today, and I'm honored to be here during quarantine week. I guess it's now quarantine month, or we're coming up on a second month here, but I appreciate everybody joining. I, as my friends on the call know, I'm not big in introductions. I, I, uh, I don't like talking about myself, but just to give a little context, I'm very fortunate and blessed to uh, be a part of the Block School. I've been a professor in the EMBA program now for a few years and have been involved in executive education. Uh, my day job is at Cerner. Most of you are probably familiar with Cerner, where I le actually, believe it or not, lead a group of faculty at Cerner. We, we have a, a bit of a university that we provide for VA leadership. The VA is one of Cerner's big clients. Uh, and I'm honored and thrilled to be at Cerner. I've been with Cerner um, off and on about 21, a little over 21 years now. Uh, so that's what I do with the day job. But I have nothing but love for the Brew Nation and UMKC, and I'm honored and thrilled to be with you today to talk about a pertinent topic for, for our time, really, and that's leading and influencing others in times of crisis and through change. And I think you would all agree that we are certainly going through change at this period of time. And throughout the presentations today, if you have any comments, uh, I'm big on the the Zoom group the Zoom group chat, and would appreciate your commentary there if you have questions or anything like that. I will certainly reach out to a couple of you as well and and ask questions uh, well as a group for for your feedback and input there. Certainly verbally, if you have anything as well. I know at least to start, Maggie's got you on mute, but we can unmute you where appropriate. We will definitely not go past one o'clock unless there are a lot of good questions. Uh, I'm happy to entertain those. But I appreciate you being with me today. For those of you that have seen me present, I, uh, I'm, I'm a multimedia guy. I like very visual slides as well as video clips. We're going to try our video clips. I've had good success with them in other webinars by doing what I'm doing today where I'm dialed in through Zoom through my phone. And then we've got the video and the, the uh, embedded into my presentation, which is running from my laptop. I've got uh, external speakers set up. So what I'll do when I have the three or four video clips that I'll show throughout the presentation, just hold my phone up to the speakers. It seems to have worked fairly well. Your mileage may vary. If you're Julie Smith who lives way out in the country, maybe we'll, we'll see with the internet connection there. But hopefully be, they're, they're brief video clips. I think they're fun and they add to the session today. With that, we'll get started with a question. You ready? A little trivia, a little question. Brittany, you can't respond because you know the answer. All right, what percentage of organizations do you think are successful with their change efforts? And we define success as they've uh, actually had organizational change occur and all those have adopted the new process or tool or whatever it is they're imparting. Go ahead and type into chat what you think, what percent do you think each year is successful? 30%, thank you, Andrea. 50%, Alexandra is very optimistic. I like her optimism, but maybe a little high. Great. 30, 25, 25 or less. Hey, Gene, good to see you. Taylor, Nikki. Hey, Nikki. Wow, good, to have, good to have Nikki on. Uh, some of you are close. Some of you are not. We have some optimism. I love the optimism. Unfortunately, it's only 15%. Brittany knew the answer because she's seen me do this before. 15%. And if you think about the time, the energy, the money lost uh, each year, it's in the billions of dollars in the United States alone with failed change efforts. And yet there are leaders who are much, much more proficient at leading change. They, they succeed well beyond the 15%. And these leaders understand this. They understand that the reason many change efforts fail is that adaptive challenges are, are treated like technical problems. And great leaders understand that change is not about simply slapping a solution together or a tool or a process. You're, you're doomed to fail if you think your job is done just because you have a fancy new tool. And if any of you have tried to get your organization to adopt Microsoft Teams, or gosh, let's look at Zoom, or Adobe or, or any of these new solutions that have come into prominence since we've been on quarantine, not everybody always embraces these new tools right away. Great leaders or processes or complete shifts, reorganizations, great leaders understand this concept of adaptive. And let's take a look at these. You know, when organizations have technical challenges, they're, they're easier to identify. Something is broken. We can see it. It's a process. It's a tool, it's a person, it's an organization. Something is broken 
And the natural human tendency is we want to fix it quick. Let's get a quick fix in place. Let's just do it and move on. Let's go find the expert. Let's go find the IT guy that can fix this. But it's not always about technology. It's the domain expert that can help solve us, uh, solve this problem. And, and a lot of times people are receptive to technical solution. There's an app for that. Okay, I'm on board. Uh, but what happens in most organizations, it's not the technical problems that get in the way. It's people problems. These are adaptive things. These are hard to identify and easier to deny. And they require human beings to change their mentality, their values, their beliefs, their roles, their relationships, how they approach work. And great leaders understand that they need to involve those humans, those people, to get change to occur. <clears throat> and they invest in human beings. And they don't just rely on a couple of experts in the legal department or IT or HR or a couple of good leaders to do it. They get everybody involved. They, they understand the behavior science around change. And really the better word is transition. Uh, please allow me to give you a newer example. So even if you've seen me do some of this presentation before, this part might be new to you. Uh, three or four years ago, my blood pressure was off the chart. It's not a HIPAA violation, by the way, if I share my medical information with you freely. And my blood pressure was really out of control and it was high and I went to the doctor and the doctor was very, very busy that day. They checked my blood pressure and I actually remember the reading when I went in, it was 180 over 110, which if you know anything about blood pressure, that's not good at all. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, your blood pressure is very high. But again, the doctor was very busy that day. He said, yep, you got high blood pressure. Now type in the chat, what do you think the doctor did next? Yep, you have high blood pressure. What do you think he did? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Medication, you are wise. Maggie, medication, a prescription. Yep, church K. Yeah, let me quickly write a prescription for you. And guess what he did? He wrote a prescription for this bad boy right here. This is lisinopril. Some of you may be familiar with that. He said, take this, your blood pressure is going to go down. It's like a conveyor belt. Next. Well, hold on here a second. You know, through the magic of Google and the internet, we can read that unless we have a genetic disposition, there's other ways to lower blood pressure. And I stopped my doctor and I said, all right, I, my wife will tell you I hate medication. I'm not a medication guy. I don't even take aspirin. Sorry. What it, it, exercise diet, is there really a way to lower blood pressure without you just writing a prescription? I said it nicer than that, but he paused. I caught him off guard. He took a deep breath. It was almost like, all right, human-to-human -human interaction. He said, okay, tell me about your job. Tell me about your personal life. Are you stressed? I said, yeah, my job, and this is in between Cerner, so I wasn't at Cerner at the time. I said, I'm stressed out of my mind. He said, well, tell me about that. I said, well, you know, I drive to work, and I start to get sick. And I won't go into details about that. He said, wow, you know, woof. Mm -hmm. Do you have someone you could talk to? I said, well, I'm not that level, but I'm certain that is hurting my blood pressure. He said, tell me about your diet. I said, well, I've put on 15 to 20 pounds since I've started this job, and I've only been there a year. And I eat terribly. He said, okay, quit your job. That's what he said. Wow. It's easy for you to say. Quit your job because your blood pressure, I'm, I'm, you're going to stroke out, and I'm worried about you. I, I want to see you in a month with or without this medication. I'm going to give you this medication, but yes, change your eating habits, go for walks, remove yourself, if you can, from the stressful situation. So what did I do? I did. I quit my job. I walked away. Straight away, I quit, walked away, because there's, at the end of the day, we, we've all got a greater appreciation for this now. Health is the most important thing we have. It is. It's the most important thing our loved ones have. And I'm not a very good husband or father or leader of people if I'm stressed out of my mind. So I walked away from that job. It was not a good culture for me. I lost 25 pounds. I started exercising again. Got into better habits. I ate healthier. I gave up soda. I have a coffee addiction, but I was able to kick soda to the curb. Uh, I ate more salads. I ate more soups. What do you think my blood pressure did? Thank you, Alexandra. It went down dramatically. It went down dramatically. And now I've really solved the problem, haven't I? Because if I just take this, when I stop taking this, what happens to my blood pressure? It goes right back up. 
So now I've fought off the aging process for a little bit longer and don't have to rely on lisinopril to keep my blood pressure down. And I know that because I invested in my own little blood pressure machine and I take my blood pressure regularly at home. And when genetics do kick in and I go the way of my elderly parents who are still alive, then I will take lisinopril down the road, but not yet, not yet. First, I'm gonna fight it off by taking care of myself. I have tackled the adaptive challenge. I have changed who I am, my values, my beliefs. And it's no different at work when we're trying to lead people through change. We have to get them to feel something, to transition, just like I felt, hey, I don't like drugs, I don't wanna take them. How can I transition? which is the second part there. That's the psychological process people experience when they accept and adapt to change. I don't even like the word change. Change happens without people transitioning. As leaders, we wanna focus on getting people to transition, getting them through that psychological process, getting them to willingly follow us because at the end of the day, that's what leadership is all about. How can we influence others as it says here, and this is my favorite description of leadership, and it comes from Australia, in order to gain their willing consent in the ethical pursuit of the mission. My goal every day when I go into work or when I wake up and work here from my basement is to influence others to get their willing consent. I never want someone following me, including my adult children or, or my neighbors or my wife or the people I work with, out of, for any reason other than they see something in me that Maybe they're, they're drawn to or they gravitate to. If you're the type of leader that leads through fear or leads through, I'm going to dangle a promotion over you or a raise over you, then you shouldn't be a leader. And I, I pull no punches when it comes to that. Leadership and moving people through change is about inspiring and influencing. That's when, how, why people are going to move. You get them to feel something, and feeling's a big part of it. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is only the persuaded can persuade. If you're leading people through change, they will see right through you if you're not bought in. And, and what I tell groups sometimes, and I practice what I preach, I left a very, uh, you know, a very good job that compensated me well because I could no longer get behind the organization's culture uh, and I could no longer persuade. You have to be all bought in. If you're only halfway bought in, we see through that. We see right through that. And that's job number one. Before you get into these top seven, only the persuaded can persuade. You have to be bought in. All right, number one. It sounds cliche, but it's true. You have to lead by example. I love this little cartoon. Can everybody see that there? Don't be the guy up top or the gal up top. The boss from the glass office that leads by spouting off of euphemisms and nice quotes, and here's a Brene Brown quote and a Simon Sinek quote. You all run off and go do some work. I love Brene Brown and Simon Sinek, but a leader has to get down there occasionally. Now, it's going to depend on your role with your organization and do just that and lead and be willing to get into the trenches every now and then, especially when it comes to a change effort. You have to feel that pain that your organization is going to feel. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Moneyball. Anybody seen Moneyball? Type in the chat if you've seen that movie. Anybody? It's Brad Pitt. I mean, who doesn't like Brad Pitt, right? Come on. All right. Moneyball tells the story. Right on. Every lot of, lot of movie lovers here are Brad Pitt lovers. Moneyball tells the story of Billy Bean, who was a revolutionary, truly was, general manager for the Oakland Athletics in baseball, who really ushered in analytics into baseball uh, before anybody else really brought it forward. He was a, a bit of a savant. Now, if you've seen the movie or know anything about sports, was Billy Bean warmly embraced as he tried to implement change into Major League Baseball, specifically the athletics? What do you think? Now, they, 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 they thought he was some geek, some nerd, and they were more into the eye test. I can see these athletes. I know who's good. And don't, don't bring your fancy pants analytics or data to me. And now everybody in the world uses analytics. Analytics touch almost every company or organization in the world. And ironically, some of that started in sports, started in baseball. Now, the scene you're about to see where this is still early, where Billy Bean is trying to, and he's just starting to get his 
uh, vision of analytics, running a sports franchise through analytics. And the, the actor you're looking at is representing John Henry. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world who owns the Boston Red Sox, as well as Liverpool in the English Premier League. Uh, one of the most uh, famous soccer clubs in the world. And John Henry saw what most owners in baseball didn't, that Billy Bean was on to something and he was revolutionizing it. And he knew that if Boston didn't adopt his mentality, they were going to be left in the dust. So the scene you're about to see is take is in Fenway Park at John Henry's suite. And this is the actor playing John Henry trying to convince Billy Bean to join the Red Sox and give him some counsel about the old guard who's trying to stomp him down and say, you're, you know, who are you, some hotshot kid trying to come in here? So let's take a look at this video, and I'm going to hold my phone up to the speakers. I know you're saying out there, but the first guy through the wall, you always get. I know you're taking the teeth out there, but the first guy through the wall, you always get bloody. Always. This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the gang. But really, what's threatening is their livelihood, it's threatening their jobs, it's threatening a way to. And every time that happens, whether it's a government or a way of doing business or whatever it is, the people who are holding the reins have their hands on the switch, they go batshit crazy. I mean, Anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. All right, hopefully you could pick up on that. I fixed the volume midway through. Could you all hear that okay? Great, we got three or four clips left to come. When people feel that their way of life is threatened, they go bat bleep crazy. Sorry, I meant to bleep the, the word out there. Uh, and that's key. We're going to talk about that in one of the later top sevens for leaders to think about. But a great leader understands that. He understands that the first guy through the wall, which was the opening quote, gets bloody. And you're going to get bloody. When you are introducing change to your organization, your, whether it's your, just your direct reports, your team, or broader, you are going to get bloody. And that's okay. And you have to experience uh, some of that with your team. That is leading by example. Uh, Billy Bean went on to do great things and revolutionize the sport, but you cannot lead from behind that desk. I love this quote from a Fortune 500 leader, one of the few women that is CEO of a Fortune 500 company, by the way. You cannot lead from behind your desk. You have to get out. You have to be visible for your customers, your clients, your employees, which is why in the crisis we have today, as it says in the second point there, during a crisis, and we've got a big crisis, you have to be calm. You have to be confident. You have to tell the truth always. And you have to be willing to face a crisis, not shy away from it. You have to embrace it. There's a lot of change going on right now. And what's happening right now may change us forever. Business may be done differently from, from this point forward. Uh, a lot of businesses are having to adapt. I was uh, devastated, too strong a word, but disappointed to read yesterday that the Webster House has closed permanently. Anybody familiar with the Webster House restaurant in Kansas City? They sell clothing there and other items. Permanently closed. Not temporarily, they're done. Uh, and a lot of companies, yeah, I love the Webster House. Same, Maggie. A lot of companies are having to do business differently. AMC movie theaters. I hope they survive. I have a lot of good friends there. Uh, who knows what the movie business will look like going forward. There's going to have to be change, and it may be bloody, and it may be uncomfortable, but now is the time for leadership. You've got to step up in a calm manner, lead from the front when you're trying to get people to transition and move forward. If you want to get people to transition, you have to, not, you have to show people what that looks like. You can't just articulate it from your office. You have to show what it looks like. Get into the trenches yourself a little bit. Experience it yourself. Show that expertise, build those relationships. That matters to your credibility. Don't just talk the talk. You will fail. You have to walk that walk with your team a bit. You will build your credibility when you're willing to get into the trenches a little bit with them. It really does come down to trust. I've modified what you're about. Some of you have seen me talk about trust before and I've tweaked it over the years. Job number one is lead by example. 
job number 1A is get behind what you're doing, then lead by example. But if you want people to willingly follow you, everything comes down to the magic five letter word of trust. Can you develop trust in those around you? Can you create these trusting relationships? Here's an HBR article I pulled just from a few months ago. I was fascinated by this. Some of you are familiar with Marcus Buckingham's work. If you're not on a team, you're only 8% engaged. Just by being on a team, your engagement level doubles. You can see the middle there, 17% engaged. But if you're on a team and you trust your leader, if that's all you do, I have that trust, half the team is almost triples from that middle graph. Uh, that's the power of trust. If people trust you as a leader and as a human being, they are going to willingly follow you. It really is that simple. Now, gaining that trust, that's the part that's not so simple. But you are going to be able to transition people, not change them, transition them when you've got that trust built. And here's the secret sauce. This is relatively new. Most of you probably haven't seen this, even if you've seen me present before. I've done a lot of research uh, over the last several years on trust, and really the choice to trust comes down to these four distinct assessments. Sincerity, reliability, confidence, Confidence doesn't matter, and care. Do you really care about human beings? Or do you look at human beings as a means to an end? The sweet spot is in the middle here. That's a little patch of gold, if you will. If your team, not just your teams, your peers, your managers, your bosses, the organization sees you as a sincere leader, a reliable leader, and by sincerity, are you authentic? Do you act the same around everyone? Reliable? Do you do what you say you will do? I will have information to you within 24 hours. Do you have it to your folks within 24 hours? Are you confident? Do you have the ability to do what you say you're going to do? Do I have that skill set? If not, I will go get it. I will tell the group, I don't know the answer to that, or I cannot get that, but I'm going to go find someone who does. And most importantly, and this is the most important of the four, just think about yourself. You don't even need to take my word for it. Think about the leaders in your life that you've gravitated to the most, whether it be professionally or personally. I'm going to bet that you felt that they genuinely cared about you as a person, as a human being. When you feel that connection to a leader, you are much more likely to run through a wall for that person. I have a wonderful leader today, today, a boss that I report to at Turner. We all run through walls for that person. He hits the sweet spot here. He's incredibly competent and reliable. He's sincere and authentic, but we feel it's love. That's a, that's a four-letter word you don't often hear in the workplace, love. For some of you, oh, we can't talk about that. Huh? But you know what? We feel love and care and empathy and humanity from our leader. And you know what? That inspires us to follow him, to transition, to know that everything's going to be all right, and to work harder and do our best and be more productive. Imagine that. You don't have to lead through fear. That damages productivity. That's a conversation for another day. But these are the four sweet spots. Caring is perhaps the most important, and especially in today's world, caring and empathy go hand in hand. Are you empathetic to what people are dealing with right now in this world? And everybody's dealing with different things. Most likely, most of you either know someone who has COVID-19 or you know someone who has, who knows someone who has COVID-19. And this continues to spread. Uh, one of my favorite guilty pleasures is kind bars. Anybody eat these kind bars for protein or anything like that? I'm an outdoor guy. I'm not hiking or playing disc golf. Uh, I utilize kind bars. Anybody like kind bars? Anybody eat kind? Am I the only one? Good. Very. I, I get. I got no stock in that. But the CEO, I'm fascinated by him. He's a he's an immigrant, came here with nothing and founded uh, this incredible company. And he uses empathy as a business tool, which is fascinating. And he has a great quote, which you're about to see. It is imperative for us to overcome the challenges that we face. And unless we can join forces and recognize each other's humanity, how can we do business together? Think about that quote. How much better would the world be or the United States be if all politicians on both sides of the aisle followed that advice, we would be much better at transitioning as a country and getting through this virus situation that we're in right now. 
empathy is, is a tool that is woefully underutilized, not just in business, uh, but in life. And I love the commentary, by the way. Impassion, I love that word, word Geraldine. very nice. At the end of the day, trust is, is this. It, it, it really is this simple. Can you make human to human connections? Here's the thing. I tell this to leaders all the time. I, I, I'm fortunate to do some executive coaching on the side. I'll use a, uh, I'll use, I'm, not gonna, I don't, I'm not a big cursor, but I'll use a word just to emphasize. Nobody gives a crap, I can use that word, about your title. Titles don't mean anything. Titles do not make leaders. Nobody freaking cares. What makes a leader is his or her ability to inspire or rally people around him or her. And what makes a leader is the ability to make this human human connection. Can you connect with people at their level? Can you have empathy? Can you have understanding? Can you still hold people accountable and preserve relationships? Make no mistake, nothing I say here is saying ignore problems, but there's a kind and clear way to deal with issues. You know who's really good at making human to human connections? This guy right here, Patrick Mahomes. Sadly, for some, we don't have any sports anymore. But one of the last big sporting events we got to see was what? The Super Bowl. Who would have thought you would still be alive for some of you to see the Chiefs win the Super Bowl? So the, maybe the apocalypse is near because the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, right? One of the things I like about Patrick Mahomes, this is just that he's a crazy good athlete with a freakishly strong arm and all the instincts you want. But by all accounts, you, you can't. You don't hear anything bad coming about, out about Patrick Mahomes. His teammates love him. His family loves him. He seems to genuinely care. I had a friend who was at a restaurant. Patrick Mahomes was there, and he paid for everybody in the restaurant, paid for their dinner on his way out without saying anything. You hear these stories about him. And one of the reasons he's such an effective leader is because he's bonded with his teammates. The Chiefs set a record for comeback wins during this past year and came back uh, every single playoff game to win the playoff game. Here's a clip that I got from the deep underbelly of the internet that you're about to see of Mahomes here talking to his teammates early in this year, this past year. They were on the road at Detroit, and like, as was the case in many games, they were down in the fourth quarter. Listen to and watch how Patrick Mahomes makes human-to-human -human connections and gets his team to rally about him. Watch this clip. We do not have to do anything else other than being ourselves. I truly believe that. If we just be ourselves and trust in each other, we will go down there and we can put points up, we can do what we do. Don't try to go out here and do everything for yourself. Believe in your teammates. You know what I mean? Believe in each other. And when we'll get these opportunities, we'll go down and we'll find a way to win the game. Let's go right here. We do our own. We do our own. We do our own. We do our own. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to run through a wall right now. I mean, I've got cabin fever anyway. Mahomes got me fired up. I feel like Napoleon Dynamite. I'm going to throw a football over that mountain. A few of you who are old like me will understand where that quote came from. But anyway, uh, Patrick Mahomes is a real leader, and he is someone who his teammates willingly follow him. And I know – I don't know, but the Chiefs probably don't win the Super Bowl if they don't feel a connection to their quarterback. You hear about how important culture is in sports. Well, gee, is culture important in business and in the organizations you work? Oh, I'll bet it is. I'll bet it is. Culture can be as important as the, the talent behind who you're hiring. Is that person a cultural fit? Number three, then. So number one, lead by example. Number two, uh, build trust. Number three, you have to do this. Uh, have any of you ever worked in an organization where your vision is changing on a weekly basis? It's confusing. The priorities are changing almost daily. Now, make no mistake, organizations have to adapt. They have to evolve or they become obsolete. Uh, but you, if you want to lead, have to be able to articulate and execute a clear vision. Even if it's not yours, your team needs to hear that. Uh, Alice in Wonderland. I love this quote from Lewis Carroll who wrote Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. It's true, isn't it? As a leader, people are looking at you to get them to where they need to go. And you've got to be able to say, look, here's the path. It's going to be okay. Now, this path may get squirrely at times. We may be looking over the edge of the cliff like you see here in the photo. But we are going to get there. 
And make no mistake, as, as, and I do like Simon Sinek, I referenced him earlier, a follower with a vision is a leader. A leader without a vision is a follower. This is not about titles. A change agent does not have to be the person in authority. But if you want to be a change agent or a transition agent, if you will, you've got to be able to establish or articulate a shared vision, the why. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. People buy why you do it who you are as a leader and as a human being. And you cannot be all over the place on a weekly basis with what's important. Priorities do change, no question, but if they're changing daily, that's probably a problem. Tap into others, don't try to do it yourself when you execute that vision. Here's a great clip of Simon uh, underneath this picture. One of my favorite quotes, vision without execution is hallucination. Here's the thing about being a great leader. If you're not a visionary, you can still be successful if you're great at building relationships and you're great at execution. But what you want to do then is surround those visionary strategic people around you. Here's the flip side of that. Many of you are great with the vision. You're great. I can see around the corner. I can be strategic. But maybe you're not as good with the execution. Surround yourself with project managers and people who can execute. Watch this clip from Simon Sinek talk about the need to do both if you're going to lead people to a transition or transition state. Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. It's all fine and good to have vision. It's all fine and good to know your why, but if you can't execute it, then it's no value whatsoever. Even organizations that have a clear sense of why, that have a clear sense of why they exist, their purpose, cause, or belief that defines their very existence. The challenge still exists of, Okay, now that I know that, how do I implement it? When we're clear on the why, the strategic decisions that we can make after that become actually much simpler. Take Steve Jobs, for example. He believed that technology should seamlessly integrate into our lives and that we shouldn't have to change the way we live our lives to fit technology. Technology should fit how we live. This is the reason why simplicity mattered. This is the reason why design mattered. This thing that he believed was so important that it drove all of his decisions. It set their strategy. It also is what allowed for all the innovation. There's a wonderful story that is told how Steve Jobs and some of his senior executives went to Xerox Park in the early 80s and were shown something that Xerox had developed called the graphic user interface. The problem was Steve Jobs with his vision of seamlessly integrating technology into our lives sees this graphic user interface and sees it as a much better way to getting to his vision. So he says to his executives, we have to invest in this graphic user interface thing. And his executives say to him, Steve, if we invest in this, we're going to blow up our own business. To which he replies, better we should blow it up than someone else. And that decision became the Macintosh. When we're clear in our why, the strategic directions that we choose become so self-evident, even if they're expensive. There's nothing efficient about innovation. Innovation is the application of technology to solve problems, but you have to know which problem you're setting out to solve. We could spend an hour just unpacking that two-minute clip. Uh, one of the things that jumps out at me is Steve Jobs said, Better we blow up our company than someone else do it for us. Do you think Blockbuster wished they had blown up their company before Netflix took them out? Do you think Kodak Film wished that they had blown up their company like Fuji Film did? It was the exact same as Kodak back in the day. They just had film, but Fuji diversified, and now Kodak is, is barely standing. Do you think Toys R Us? wish that they had blown up their company, much like Build-A-Bear did, to become a, a, about the only successful uh, toy organization out there. Better we do it than have someone else do it for us. But in order to do that and to transition people, we have to have the vision or find somebody who does, and we have to be able to execute. And as a leader, you need to look for those two things. Number four, and this is one of the most important ones to go over, perhaps the second most important behind building trust, meeting others where they are. And allow me to give an example. Uh, Nikki, you cannot play because you've seen me do this before, and Brittany. Uh, but I have some new information even for you, Nikki and Brittany. I met Miss America, Heather Whitestone's cousin, about six months ago, and she validated and filled in some of the blanks with the story I'm about to tell you. First off, let's play Jeopardy. Any, any Jeopardy fans out there? I have no prizes for you. Maybe I'll send you my old bottle of lisinopril. Not very exciting. All right, here we go. Besides being Miss America in 1995, does anybody know what Heather Whitestone was known for? Type it in the chat if you know.
All right, it's a tough question. I'll give you a hint. Let's show her picture. Does that help in any way, shape, or form? What is she doing with her hand? Anyone type that? What do you think? It is sign language. G dog. I like that. All right. That's that must be Geraldine. G dog. G dog. Yes. Uh, she was the first deaf Miss America, and I believe somebody can fact check me that this is "I love you" in sign language. And when Matt, yes, thank you. Much better than me, G dog. When Heather Whitestone won Miss America in 1995. She did not hear her name get called. She had someone sign it to her that she won Miss America. And when when she won, uh, there was a newish technology that was going around for individuals who were hearing impaired or deaf. And does anybody know the name of that technology that a lot of people were able to take advantage of? More Jeopardy? Cochlear implant. And being Miss America has its perks. There was no shortage of doctors that came out of the woodwork and said, hey, Miss America, Heather Whitestone, you're a candidate to receive a cochlear implant. Uh, Heather Whitestone was not born deaf. She lost her hearing as a toddler. And uh, being Miss America, these doctors said, we'll do it for free. There's no risk to your health. We think there's a 99% chance that you're going to be able to hear again. And after some debate and some thought, Miss America responded to all these doctors coming out of the woodwork by saying this. This is what she signed back. She didn't say it. I don't need, in all caps, this is a direct quote that she signed, a cochlear implant. Now, wait a minute here. We've got all the facts in the world in front of her. She'll be able to hear. There's no risk to her health. And it's going to be free. And she says no. Have you ever felt within your organizations that you have all the data and facts in the world that you're presenting to someone? Here's the analysis. It's right there. The answer is right in front of your face. And they still say, yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm getting, guessing and betting many or all of you have. Why do you think Miss America would refuse a free cochlear implant, a free opportunity to possibly hear again? Type your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, Alex, it's a valuable part of our identity. Uh, Gene, spot on. I don't need it. I'm fine just the way I am. And you hit on something there, Gene. How many times in the workplace do you hear people say, you know what, this process, this tool, this policy, my job is good just the way it is. Do you ever come across that? And they don't want to move. They don't want to adapt. They don't want to adjust. I'm sure these fat cat blockbuster executives were in love with their late fees and thought, we're just fine. Don't worry about Redbox or Netflix. We're just fine. And people don't move. And Miss America lived for years after 1995 without a cochlear implant. And she didn't feel like she needed it. And she didn't want, she thought to herself, what about the people that can't, that aren't, don't have the benefit of being Miss America and can't get a cochlear implant for free? But you know what happened? One day, Miss America changed her mind. There was a seminal event that happened in her life which caused her to get that implant. What do you think it was? Type it in the chat. Close, Maggie. Very close, Jean, Maggie. She had her first son. She ended up having five sons, four or five sons, and did not get an implant right away. But she did because the story I'm about to tell you really happened in her life, and I had her cousin validate this to me and fill in some missing blanks, her first cousin. Her son was two or three years old, was a toddler playing in the backyard on playground equipment. They had some playground equipment set up in the backyard. And as a doting mother, she was uh, downstairs in her basement, and she was preparing some food in a kitchen downstairs in the basement, looking outside. She would turn her head to look at her son playing on the slide, playing on the swings. She'd cook. She'd look. And there was a brief moment where she looked and could not see her son. Now, I don't know about any of you, but has anybody ever lost a kid 
for even 20 seconds, 30 seconds outside, it's terrifying. Don't tell my wife, but I lost my oldest child, who's 25 now, at Disney World for about five minutes. That's a story for another day. And that was might have been the most afraid I've ever been, even knowing that there were 30,000 cameras at Disney because my aunt worked there, so I didn't know that. Um, but uh, I was with my daughter at the time. My wife was with our other child at the time. She couldn't find her son. She did what most mothers would do. She ran outside. Now, remember, at this point, much love, Julie. You lost yours at Walmart. Uh, at this point, Miss America, Heather Whitestone, cannot hear. She runs outside and sees her son underneath the slide, blood all over his face, and he is screaming and signing for his mother. Now, it's one thing not to hear your name get called when you win Miss America. It's entirely another not to hear your name being called Mommy, Mommy, Mommy from your son who has fallen off the slide and cracked his head open and gashed his head and has blood dripping all down his face, not to be overly graphic. She wiped off his face. Fortunately, her son survived just fine with a 20-something stitches, according to the cousin, on the, on the, on the head. But at that moment, that was the moment where she said, I have to be there for my son. I have to be able to hear him. I have to be able to hear him. She went on to have the cochlear implant. It was successful. You can see that picture is only five years old. She had four sons, and that's her husband. So she's surrounded by five men in her life. God love her. And she hears today. Her hearing wasn't fully restored, but close because of the cochlear implant. What's the point for you all? Why do I tell you this story? Because whoever you're trying to influence, whether it's your significant other, whether it's your kids, whether it's your next door neighbor, whether it's your direct reports, whether it's your friends in academia, you have to go where they are. It's not about you. You have to go where your audience members are, whoever you're trying to influence and find that person's crying child. What is the pain point in that person's life that the transition that you're pushing will solve? You will keep your job. You will keep your health. This will create additional career opportunities for you. This will create efficiencies. This is better for our clients. This is better for our students. But whatever you're saying, it has to be personal to that individual. And I think about this anytime I'm implementing change or I'm implementing transition. What is the win? Even if it's not an ideal win, what is the win for that person? And that's what I lead with. Number five, communicate, communicate communicate some more. In times of crisis, in times of change, in times of transition, we crave hearing from our leaders. You have to be visible. Here are the golden rules for communicating change. You ready? And I took this out of, I think, Forbes magazine. This is a recent article. Number one, you cannot rationalize not communicating. You can't. There's never an excuse. You have zero excuses for keeping information to yourself unless it's going to negatively impact someone and there's a time and a place. But you know what? If the great mind doesn't have the news, they're going to make it up, aren't they? People are going to tell themselves stories that are probably counterproductive. This happens in every single workplace. Do people love to gossip? Sadly, yes, they do. And they're going to tell themselves stories, which is why you, as the leader, need to control the narrative. Please recall this, people need to hear it or see it seven times before it sticks. There's behavior science around that. And if you're a great leader, you're gonna to look to communicate through different mediums, posters, email, intranet, in-person, email, text, whatever it is, people need to hear something seven times before it starts to stick. Do not rely on trickle down. If you're an executive, do not tell your manager Tell your people this. Yes, some of that needs to occur, but as much as you can as the leader, you do the communication. And this is huge. It goes back to being honest and being reliable. Say what you know, but as importantly, say what you don't know. Don't fake it till you make it. You lose all credibility when you do that. Say what you don't know. Commit to a time to provide more information. My current leader is brilliant at that. He has most of the answers, but when he doesn't, he tells us and he finds out. 
Yes, people need to hear something seven times, but you're, even in today's world, even in the world of text we live in, and even with millennials, Gen Z, whatever you want to call it, personal communication is always the form of personal is, is always the form of communication that can be best understood. Why would I say that? Go ahead and type in chat. Why is personal communication best understood? Shows you care, thank you. What else? It's clear. And what do you get from personal communication, even through Zoom right now, that you can't get through email? Yeah, Alexandra, always wise. You get that human-to-human -human connection to build relationships, but you see me. You see my body language and you hear my tone. And you can fake it through typed words. You can. Some of you are really good writers or text givers or emailers. But you know what you can't fake ever is body language and tone. We know when someone's angry, sarcastic, condescending, arrogant, unreliable, lying. All of that comes through tone and body language. Body language and tone a man named Albert Barabian, who's a professor emeritus at Stanford, who spent his life studying this sort of thing. 92% of what we tell a person about ourselves comes from body language and tone. Only 8% comes from the words out of the mouth. Remember that next time you're communicating. 92% comes from body language or tone. If you're like me, I can typically tell what kind of mood a loved one is in within three seconds. I'll go visit my parents, social distancing, I'll look at them through their glass door. I'll bring them groceries or whatever. I can tell within two seconds if they've been fighting. Now, they've been married for 54 years. <laughs> but I can tell immediately if they've had a good day together or they've gotten on each other's nerves. And many of you are probably like me because body language and tone are more powerful. So remember that as you communicate change, as you communicate transition. And tell stories. Cool little slide there. Daniel Pink's one of my favorites. For those of you that have ever read Daniel Pink's works, uh, A Whole New Mind or Drive is a great book he wrote. Stories represent a pathway to understanding that doesn't run through the left side of the brain. Your ability to tell stories will allow you to connect with individuals because stories do this. Stories release cortisol, oxytocin, and dopamine. Cortisol has a little stress. COVID-19 brings stress if we're talking about COVID-19, but that holds our attention. Oxytocin is more of a feel-good hormone and dopamine. Oxytocin comes when we watch kitty videos. Geraldine will appreciate that. Dogs and cats on YouTube. We get that. Oxytocin is released. You know the top three YouTube clips are dogs, cats, and babies. I'm not making that up. That's what people search for the most. Why? Because oxytocin gets released. Dopamine comes from the happy ending. When we get a happy ending to a story, dopamine comes. You hear about runners, if any of you are runners, runners highs, dopamine gets released there. Great leaders tell stories. They take complicated topics, data, analysis, and they turn it into a story, and they go to that crying child of their audience. Another time, hopefully I can talk to you all about how to take data and turn it into a story, because we, turn, we tune out data. Human beings were exposed to so much information and data today, we tune it out. I can get any answer in the world by asking dang near any answer by asking Alexa or Siri. How crazy is that? Or maybe it's Alexandra, another, another Alex there. But we tune data and information out because of what we're exposed to. Storytelling, though, runs to a different path. One more clip here uh, on the art of storytelling. Do you know every single Pixar movie? Anybody watch Pixar movies? I'm not afraid to tell you that up the movie Up, if anybody's seen that, is one of my favorite movies of all time, and I cried like a baby when I first saw Up. Don't judge me. Every Pixar movie, every one has made over $100 million at the box office. Did you know that? And you want to know why? Because they follow a formula where oxytocin, dopamine, and, and uh, cortisol get generated. That's how they hold your attention and reel you in. Take a look. Here's a director, a young director, who directed Monsters, Inc., another great Pixar movie, and when they do release the new Pixar movie coming up, which has been on the shelf because of uh, COVID-19, he's the director of it. Uh, Inside Out's another one he did, and I think he did Up as well. 
watch him talk about the art of storytelling. It's just a two minute clip, but listen for the keys when you're telling a story in a business setting uh, or a personal setting, listen for the keys to good storytelling, which will cause your message to stick. Here we go. Hey, Val. How's it going? You know what? I'm, I'm having a really bad day. What happened? See what Val's saying when she says, what happened is, tell me a story. And that's actually what this season of Pixar in a Box is all about. To make a movie here at Pixar takes years, but it all starts with a story. Humans have been telling stories since we could speak, probably even before. We tell stories around the campfire. We write plays. We write novels, short stories. We make movies. We take photographs, tweet to each other. The list goes on. The power of story is that it has an ability to connect with people on an emotional level. One of the things you hear all the time this advice is write what you know. Now, as a kid, I was like, I don't want to write about suburban Minnesota. It's boring. I want to write about explosions and monsters and car chases. Well, what that actually means is, yeah, go ahead and write about monsters and explosions and car chases, but put something into it that talks about your own life, how you feel. Do you feel scared? Do you feel alone? Something from your own life will make that story come alive and not just be a boring car chase. When I started directing Monsters Incorporated, the way I'd pitch it is, it's about a monster who scares kids for a living. That's his job. He clocks in, he clocks out, he eats donuts and talks about union dues. And we thought that was a pretty funny idea. And sure enough, when I would tell it to people, they would smile. But when we told the story as a film, people started getting bored and restless. And they're like, I don't understand what this movie is about. Well, what I finally figured out was that it's actually not about a monster who scares kids. It's about a man becoming a father. That was what was happening to me. So why write about what you know? Well, it's because probably what happened to you made you feel some particular way. And what you're trying to do really when you tell a story is to get the audience to have that same feel. One of the big revelations for me uh, telling stories is how much work they are, really. I always thought you'd just tell the story once and it would be perfect, and geniuses like Walt Disney or Miyazaki, this brilliance comes out of their head once and there it is. Well, the truth is, our stories don't always come out exactly perfectly the first time or the second time or the third time, or the fourth time, up to the 30th time. And so you keep going again and again and again. And only after retelling the story many, many times does it really sparkle. This season of Pixar in a Box is about how we at Pixar tell our stories in hopes that it will inspire you to tell yours. But seriously, what happened? Oh, oh so the first thing, I get to my desk, right? It's 8 o'clock. So a couple key points coming out of there. Number one, tell stories about what you know. Uh, you have to be able to connect emotionally with your audience. And if you cannot connect emotionally, it becomes increasingly difficult for you to move people to transition. Uh, when you tell your stories, connect personally, connect emotionally, human to human connection, find common ground, find their crying child. Here we go again, tapping into that listener's core values. Work on your stories over and over. Ensure that they're authentic. Ensure that you can give them in a smooth, succinct, specific manner. No one wants to hear a 25-minute story about your vacation. Sorry, they don't. And then conclude with an acceptable call to action. And if you've done well, if you've connected personally and emotionally, you've tapped into the core values, you've found that crying child, that pain point, your story, you are much more likely to have success and lead them to action. All right, one more concept to cover. I promise we'll wrap up in five minutes here. Let's look at some models, shall we? We ready for that? Everybody ready to look at some models? All right, let's take a look. <laughs> Alexander, your face was awesome there. All right, let me know when you guys are good. Geraldine, you good? Gene, Gene, you good? I can see you staring at the models there. You good, Gene? You wanna wait a little longer? All right, not those models, just a little humor, a little quarantine humor, not these guys. They're good looking. All right, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to just some change management models for 30 seconds because I'm not going to bore you with this. You're going to go to sleep. You're going to log off this call. 
I'm going to show you three models just to introduce them to you. And if you're leading a big transition effort, a change effort, grab a model that it will help you. ADCAR might be the most famous. Uh, it's a pro size solution. Create awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforce. Again, not going to go deep, but I'm, I'm going to provide this to Alexandra in a PDF and encourage her to send this out to you after I'm done so you have these. Very famous model. Influence, another extremely famous model. I like Influencer. Influence one, was one of the ways I lost all my weight, by the way. I use Influencer. To, I told you about the weight I lost. Uh, and I like Influencer because you start on the right. You start with the results, but you focus on just two to, two to three behaviors that need to change to get your results. So for me to lose weight, it was just three things. Walk 10,000 steps a day, five days a week. Cut down on sugar consumption by 80% and only drink water and coffee. That was it. I did those three things. I built out a plan over there to the left to influence those behaviors, weight came off. I've applied this behavior change model to increase employee satisfaction in the organizations that I've managed at Cerner. I've applied this model to increase client compliance in healthcare organizations, it's a very effective model. And then the most famous of all, some of you have studied John Cotter, Here's Cotter's change management framework. He's the godfather of organizational change. And basically, he's got three steps there, and I'm going to sum them up for you on this next slide. And Cotter has it right, and the other models borrow from Cotter. People in front of you are going to see something. They're going to see you, and they're going to feel something or they're not. And here's the thing as we wrap up. If they do not feel something, they will not transition. You have to create feeling if you're going to get people to transition. Data, information, words doesn't cut it. Let's watch one more clip, another two-minute clip, and then we'll wrap up with a couple slides. And I'm happy to stay as long as any of you want to stay to answer any questions. So here's one clip. Please watch this clip. Might be the most important out of the bunch about how to create feeling. And it's by an individual who wrote, uh, look, I have a talk. One of the current great books on leading people through transition is called Switch. I highly recommend this. Dan and Chip Heath, two brothers, two modern day thinkers on leading people through change. Here we go. Take a look. When we want people to change, a lot of times we try to teach them something. We feel like, well, if dad just understood the health complications that are caused by obesity, well, surely he would change his eating habits. Or if my teenage daughter just understood how dangerous it is to text while she's driving, surely she'd cut it out. The problem though, is that knowledge rarely leads to change. I mean, for instance, take the warning labels on most cigarette packs. Here's one. The cigarettes release carbon monoxide. I mean, do we think that the problem is that smokers simply don't know that cigarettes are bad for them? This isn't a knowledge problem. And the same is true for lots of other behaviors. I mean, right now, there are thousands of parents across the country trying to get their kids to understand why a tattoo may be a bad idea. The problem is when knowledge competes with coolness, you know who's going to win that one. Same goes for organizational change. When we want our employees to move in a new direction, our first instinct is to educate them. We want to bring them all together and step through a 72-slide PowerPoint presentation. John Cotter, the organizational change guru from Harvard, says that most people have a mental model that change happens in three stages. We present careful analysis, and that causes people to change their thinking, which leads to behavior change. But he says in his experience, that's almost never the way it happens. That in his experience, it happens in a different three-stage process. People see something that makes them feel something. It gives them the fuel to change. So if you want people to change, you've got to put feeling first. Let's go back to the cigarette packs for a sec, because there are other countries that actually do a much better job at connecting with emotion. So here's a pack in Italy, for instance. The translation of that is smoking kills. In Canada, they even push it a step further. They put photos on their packs like this one. Ugh. I mean, you may want that cigarette, but you catch a glimpse of those teeth and it gives you a second thought. What about this one? I think this is genius. You know, which one do we think is going to be better for the 17-year-old male psyche? The knowledge that cigarette smoking releases carbon monoxide or 
that this could happen to you. If you want your colleagues at work to change, you've got to start thinking about what you can get them to feel. You know, can you bring them face to face with customers who are underserved and have them feel some empathy? Can you confront them with some of your competitors' products that are actually better than yours? Get a little competitive spark going. But whatever you do, just don't think that your job is done after you've shared some knowledge. Change comes from feeling. Change comes from feeling, and that's a broad theme of my conversation with you today. You will fail if you just present knowledge. You have to communicate, but you have to create feeling. And when transition starts to happen, celebrate it, especially now. During this time, your teams, your colleagues need a little bit of joy. Go out of your way to wish people a happy birthday. Go out of your way to wish them a nice day. And especially when you see something successful at work, people transitioning through a difficult period and changing in a direction that your organization needs to go, celebrate that. Celebrate it. Find a way, even in today's world, to do just that. Lead through positivity and encouragement. You are much more likely to have people continue on that tr transition and change trajectory if you do just that. I'll leave you with a cartoon. And then one last slide. Yeah, nothing magical is going to happen, my friends. If you don't change, uh, nothing magical is going to happen. So if you're going to influence and lead others through this crisis or, or through a change that needs to happen in your organization, you got to follow the top seven. Lead by example, build that trust, have that vision, or, or find someone who does. Find the pain point, find the crying child. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Use a model if it helps you. Grab one of the ones I, I showed here or another one, and then celebrate success. And if you do that, believe it or not, just in the hour we've spent together, you follow these things. There's no maybe about this. You will be more successful as a change agent. But use your powers for good. Everything we talked about today can also be used from a negative perspective. And with that, if any of you have any questions, I am happy to stay as long as need be. Uh, you can uh, be unmuted or ask in chat. I would be happy to, to respond.